know, cats. Take pride in the way you finish. Let's go. Take Let's pride go. in the way you finish. Words instilled in current Northwestern head coach Pat Fitzgerald by the man who coached him, Gary Barnett. In 1992, Barnett arrived in Evanston looking to restore pride in Northwestern football. When they introduced me to uh, at halftime of the basketball game right after I had accepted the job, I went out to midcourt and they gave me the microphone and I said, we're going to take the purple to Pasadena. And of course everybody went crazy and wild and as I walked off I heard guys, people saying, is he nuts? Yes, Gary Barnett did say it. Take the purple to Pasadena. The promise was made in 1992 by a new coach that few took seriously. Northwestern in a Rose Bowl? It was a bold prediction, certainly. I don't think anybody took it at face value other than to think, you know what? Okay, I mean, so this guy is coming into this thing and thinking Northwestern's gonna win. And isn't that nice? And, you know, wouldn't that be an interesting thing if they ever did? For most people, there were two reasons to go to the football games. One, to throw marshmallows. And two, on the off chance they would win, probably against a team like Northern Illinois, you could storm the field, take down the goalposts, and try to drag them into Lake Michigan. Northwestern hadn't been to a Rose Bowl, or any bowl game for that matter, since 1949. In Barnett's first three seasons, the Wildcats had won only eight games. Everyone talked about the academic standards. They just can't recruit the kind of caliber of athletes uh, that can compete at this level in the Big Ten and major college football. They just can't do that at Northwestern, can they? They're still Northwestern. I think that's what most people you know, around Ohio State was thinking at the time. It's just one of those games that you normally mark on the schedule you know, as, as a win. Experts didn't predict anything different for the Wildcats heading into the 1995 season. But the feeling inside Dyke Stadium was vastly different. With a strong veteran squad returning, Coach Barnett and the Purple Faithful had big plans. With so many powerhouse teams in the Big Ten, the Northwestern Wildcats were picked to finish near the bottom of the conference. The uniqueness of that team was blue collar, downhill, nothing fancy, at times overpowering their opponent. The overpowering NU defense was anchored by junior Pat Fitzgerald, a fearless blue collar linebacker. Pat Fitzgerald, I remember, was a wild man on defense. He was great all season long. He was a really smart football player, not a gifted football player, but really smart. He studied the game. He, he led that defense. The Wildcat offense featured sophomore running back Darnell Autry, a tireless workhorse who was ready to break onto the national scene. I appreciated the weight on the shoulders. Um, I loved being in that position. If I knew that I did my job and, and the offensive linemen did their job, that they would give us the best opportunity to win. The big question for Northwestern was at quarterback. The spring starter quit the day before fall practice began, forcing unheralded junior Steve Schnurr to step up and lead the team. The coaching staff fussed over this problem and, 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 and practice, and they tried to work around it and figure out what to do with it, and they, kept, they all kept coming back to speak. We're going with Schnurr. He's going to be our guy, and that's the way it's going to be, and let's go. Northwestern's upset of Notre Dame in the first week of the 1995 college football season was perhaps the greatest sports achievement in the school's history. Northwestern had struggled for so long that many Wildcat faithful believed the win in South Bend had to be a fluke. There was definitely a buzz in Chicago. You know, we had kind of woken up a lot of fans that maybe had been in hibernation uh, after that win. And, you know, it was amazing. The minute we got down, I think I remember reading the paper, was it was a fluke. You know, we just, we got lucky. Two weeks later, we played Miami of Ohio, and we had a bye week in between. And of course, we were celebrating and probably reading the newspaper clippings a little bit too much. In their first game as a nationally ranked team since 1971, Northwestern built a 28-7 lead over Miami of Ohio after three quarters. I remember guys in the huddle were, you know, the band was playing and guys were kind of singing the band song and weren't really into it. But in the final 15 minutes, the Wildcats began to unravel, and suddenly, Miami of Ohio was thinking upset. I can't remember what it was exactly. It was probably one of the muff snaps or something that started it, but it just felt like, uh, it really felt like you were 
you know, caught in sort of a whirlpool and there was nothing you could do. You just knew it was going around and around and around. You were going down. We felt this game getting out of hand. And uh, sure enough, uh, with about a minute left, less than a minute left in the game, we had to punt. Oh, oh that snap! Gets past Burton. Burton chasing it down inside the five, picks it up, and he's tackled at the one yard line. Two plays later, they go in and score and beat us. Um, uh, that was really hard to swallow. The Wildcat team that shocked the world just two weeks earlier coughed up a 21-point second-half lead and lost. Final score, Miami of Ohio 30, Northwestern 28. The Wolverines' next test came at home against Northwestern, who bounced back from their stunning loss to Miami of Ohio to win their next two games. The Wildcats hadn't beat the Maize in Blue in their last 19 meetings. By that time, we had become a pretty good football program, a pretty good football team. We weren't sure how good, but we needed a test like Michigan. I remember going through the scouting report and, you know, as we read through each player on their on their side of the ball, on both the offense and the defense, it's, you know, this guy, All-American this, All-American super prep this, All-American this. and. Pretty soon, Barnett just throws the book across the thing. He goes, you know, to sum it all up, they're all All-Americans, and we probably shouldn't even go over there to play. We didn't really know. Nobody knew how good Northwestern was going to be that year. And, you know, to have Gary Barnett, nobody really knew how good of a coach he was. Scott Dreisbach, our young redshirt freshman quarterback, uh, in our off week had um, uh, fractured his thumb. He had to have surgery. He was out for the year. Coach Carr turned to Brian Greasy, a young, inexperienced walk-on. There was not, I don't think, anything from the fans or the coaches' uh, point of view that you lose uh, Scott Dreisbach and, and oh, we're, we're stuck with Greasy. That wasn't the feeling at all. The game was a vintage Big Ten defensive battle, with neither team finding the end zone in the first half. After 30 minutes, the score was tied, 6-6. We were fortunate to just have it be 6-6 because Timmy Biakapatuka had already put a bunch of yards on us and, and uh, our defense had just made enough plays to keep them out of the end zone. Greasy will hand it off, Biakapatuka hole up the middle, he's across the 45, to the outside the 50, the 45, the 40, cuts it back, he's at the 35, stiff arms him We in. sort of called ourselves the bend but don't break defense. Well, we'll give up a lot of yards, which we did. Tim Biakapatuka ran for like 500. He may still be running right now. Bianca Patuka rushed for 205 yards on the day, but never made it into the end zone. And the handoff, Bianca Patuka, and he's run down at the three and shoved back. And Eric Collier, Danny. That was Pat Fitzgerald's signature moment of the 1995 season, was stopping Tim Bianca Patuka on the goal line. NU's defense stepped up again in the fourth quarter, intercepting Greasy and setting up the Wildcats' first and only touchdown of the game. Our defense was as talented across the board as there had been in the country. I mean, we were ranked number one most of the year. Um, we knew that if our defense could make plays, that our offense, they would put our offense in a good position to, to, to score touchdowns. He's gonna throw man wide open, sliding catch, touchdown, Matt Hartle. Matt Hartle's first touchdown, and the Wildcats take the lead with 12.42 to go. Michigan was going for it late in the game, and I remember that Northwestern blitzed. And you kind of said, whoa. Like, here it is, the game's on the line at the big house against Michigan, and they are the aggressor, and it works. They rushed Michigan every chance they had. They had him off balance, they had him on their heels, they sent all kinds of different blitzes, different looks. Uh, they didn't play to tie, they played to win, and they attacked the castle instead of just trying to hang on. They did the right thing at that time. Michigan mounted a final drive, but the Northwestern secondary rose to the occasion, sealing another improbable Wildcat upset. He's hit as he throws, it's intercepted! Yes! William Bennett intercepts at the 21-yard line! We, we thought we had just lost the, you know, the bottom, bottom dwellers of the Big Ten, you know, so we were really, really down. And Northwestern has come into Ann Arbor and spoiled Michigan's unbeaten season. Northwestern was no longer a one-hit wonder. Instead, they were sitting pretty at 4-1 and one with wins over both Notre Dame 
and Michigan. That was a huge win for our confidence, and I really thought our team really came together and said, you know, this snowball's starting to roll downhill now and get, gather some more snow. Uh, we get a chance to be pretty good. Now ranked 11, Northwestern played perhaps their most impressive game of the season in front of Dyke Stadium's first sold-out crowd in over a decade as the Wildcats embarrassed number 24, Wisconsin, 35-0. Nurse sneaking for it, leaps the line, touchdown! Steve Schnur takes it in himself. His first touchdown of the year. And the you just felt right from the beginning of that game that the crowd was really behind them, place was loud, and you know, Wisconsin was turning the football over. I think they had four turnovers in the first half, and Northwestern was just shutting them down and shutting them out. Autry scored two touchdowns and broke a Northwestern record, rushing for 100 yards in his eighth straight game. I, I realized they were for real, and we weren't near as good as I thought we could have been. <laughs> However, the huge victory over the Badgers came with a price. Towards the end of the game, Sam Valenzisi kicked a great kickoff. Sam jumped up uh, to celebrate, came down, and tore his ACL and he was done for the year. Here he was, our All-American kicker. Northwestern was now 4-0 in the Big Ten, 6-1 overall. 35-30, hurdles him in, still on his feet to the 20, the 15, cuts it back to the inside of the 5, touchdown! Ensuring the Wildcats of their first winning football season since 1971. The rest of the country kept waiting for the purple bubble to burst but the Wildcats still had plenty to prove and no better place than 140 miles south in Champaign against in-state rival Illinois. In that year, when they started winning, every game, you was like, okay, when is, when is the uh, nightmare going to happen? When, are, when is it gonna, the story going to end? Illinois probably figured they were better than Northwestern, too. There have been many times in the last half century, more than a half century, where Illinois has been the better team and lost because Northwestern gets up for Illinois, Illinois simply never gets up for Northwestern. Well, the Illinois game was a huge game for us. The opening drive, they had a, they had a pass go off the helmet of one player into the hands of another player, and then all of a sudden we were down 14 points. And caught on the play by Rob Majoy. And we were gonna have to battle back. Trailing 14-10 late in the fourth quarter and facing a fourth and goal, the Wildcats rolled the Evanston Express. Darnell Autry. Up to the line. Matt Hartle in motion. The pitch to Autry. Autry to the goal line. Touchdown! Darnell Autry takes it in. And the Wildcats lead for the first time today. Darnell Autry. I mean, and, and he wasn't like a great running back. He was elusive but not very explosive but could get a lot of yards and he was the anchor he was like the MVP of the team. Now ranked fifth in the nation Northwestern had to overcome a tough Iowa team and the Sports Illustrated Jinx in their final home game on a cold and blustery day in Evanston. Brian Musso's punt return fueled a Wildcat rally to beat Iowa for the first time in two decades. There he goes. He's at the 20. He's at the 10. He's in for the touchdown. That was a red letter game for them. They really had set their goal beating Iowa because uh, that had been the program against which Gary wanted to be compared. He felt it was the most consistent program in Big Ten. Northwestern was now one game away from an undefeated Big Ten season, but they paid an expensive price. As Pat Fitzgerald, the leader of the Wildcat defense and heart and soul of the entire team, was lost for the season with a broken leg. It's just your atypical play to your left where you're getting ready to press downhill as a linebacker and go attack the line of scrimmage. and. You know, I didn't protect my legs well, and I got cut blocked, and I was getting up, and two or three guys fell over me, and yeah, instantly I knew something was wrong. We didn't spend a minute feeling sorry for ourselves, or he didn't spend a minute feeling sorry for himself. He knew that our football team and our program had some steps we still needed to take, and he was gonna do everything he could to make sure we did that. But he was not gonna abandon that football team. Heading into their final Big Ten game, both Ohio State and Northwestern were undefeated in conference play. 
For the fifth ranked Wildcats, the math was simple. Beat Purdue and win at least a share of the Big Ten title. Those were words easier said than done for one of the nation's perennial cellar dwellers. And Purdue's all-time leading rusher, Mike Allstott, was not going to go down without a fight. The game took place at ross Aid Stadium in West Lafayette, which had been infiltrated by Wildcat Nation. It was almost a surreal moment to walk out and see all of our fans in the, in the one corner across from our locker room. And Purdue at that point wasn't quite playing for the same thing that we were playing for. Northwestern concluded its perfect Big Ten season with almost a perfect game. Pass. Under the blitz, it's picked off. Martin. Chris Martin, if he gets a block, folks, he's out of here. The Wildcats cruise to victory, beating the Boilermakers 23-8 to, to complete an undefeated Big Ten season. Over the middle, complete to Bates. And in welcome to the Bates Motel. He's Barnett's motto for is always expect victory. Expect victory. So at this point in the season, we expect a victory and we expect to finish the season for the victory to put ourselves in um, at least have a chance for the big time. Darnell Autry rushed for a career high 226 yards and as hard as it was to fathom back in September, the Northwestern Wildcats were guaranteed at least a share of the Big Ten Championship. To this day, I don't think anybody in that Big Ten office really wanted to give Northwestern a trophy, but that was a special moment watching our players um, receive that trophy and to see them celebrate being co-champs in the Big Ten, nothing like it. Barnett came in and built a program based on trust, confidence, belief, and to see all that come together uh, and crystallize and, and result in the Big Ten championship, I mean, it's just, it doesn't get any sweeter.